reading chapter 10. Now the reason why I chose to read part of this book this week is because I was inspired by last week's Ghost Town story and I wanted to expand on that a little bit and really get into what the railroad was like since it was so important and then the cities that were abandoned were just abandoned by the railroad. So that's what we're going to do. Alright, so if you have your own copy of By the Shores of Silver Lake by Laura Ingalls Wilder, if you have this book, turn to chapter 10. If you don't have this book, try it, figure out a way to do a split screen and click the link and go to page 102 and 103. So if you click the link, take the link and then it should take you to where it is. And then you click where it says read. It's, bl it's a blue thing about this big, a blue button. You click that and it, it'll take you to the story. Page 102 and 103 on the online version, if it works, is where chapter 10 starts. If you can't get either one of those, just Lily's gonna film it over my shoulder so you can see the words. See the words? Okay, chapter 10. Oh wait, no, oh, take it back over there. Before we start reading, hold on, I forgot to give you the back story. When there's a book between what the last one we read was Little House on the Prairie, then there's We Were in the Middle of Farmer Boy, and then there was uh, By the Banks of Plum Creek. We, in that story, they go, they live in a dugout, it's one disaster after another, and they end up moving from there, and their pa, pa has taken a job to go work for the railroad. So that's what's going on here. Laura's about 12 or 13 at this time, I think. Yeah, Laura's about 12 or so. Okay, now we're ready to read. So that's what's going on. Chapter 10, The Wonderful Afternoon. Early every morning, while Laura washed the breakfast dishes, she could look through the open door and see the men leaving the boarding shanty and going to the thatch stable for their horses. Then there was a rattling of harness and a confusion of talking and shouts, and the men and teams went out to the job, leaving quietness behind them. All the days went by, one like another. On Mondays, Laura helped Ma do the washing and bring in the clean, scented clothes that dried quickly in the wind and sunshine. On Tuesdays, she sprinkled them and helped Ma iron them. On Wednesdays, she did her task of mending and sewing, though she did not like to. Oh, side note. While they were at Plum Creek, they, Mary got really sick. She got scarlet fever, and when she finally recovered from the illness, she was left blind. So Mary is blind now. Mary was learning to sew without seeing. Her sensitive fingers could hem nicely, and she could sew quilt patches if the colors were matched for her. At noon, the camp was noisy again, with all the teams and the men coming in to dinner. Then Pa came from the store, and they all ate in the little shanty with the wind blowing against it and the wide prairie outside the door. Softly colored in the shades from dark brown to russet and tan, the prairie rolled in gentle swells to the far edge of the sky. The winds were blowing colder at night, and more and more wild birds were flying southward, and Pa said that winter would not be long in coming, but Laura did not think about winter. She wanted to know what the, where the men were working and how they made a railroad grade. Every morning they went out, and at noon at night they came back, but all that she saw of working was a smudge of dust that came up from the tawny prairie in the west. She wanted to see the men building the railroad. Aunt Dosha, that's one of Ma's sisters, by the way, moved into the camp one day, and she brought two cows. She said, I brought our cow on, I brought our cow on the hoof. Sorry. I brought our milk on the hoof, Charles. That's the only way to get any. Out here, there aren't any farmers. One of the cows was for Pa. She was a pretty bright red cow named Ellen. Pa untied her from the back of Aunt Dosha's wagon and handed the halter rope to Laura. Here, Laura, he said, you're old enough to take care of her. Take her out where the grass is good and be sure to drive down the picket pin good and, fi good and firm. Laura and Lena, Lena's her cousin, by the way, picketed the cows not far apart in good grass. Every morning and every evening, they met to take care of the cows. They led them to drink from the lake and moved the picket pins to fresh grass. And then they did the milking, and while they milked, they sang. Laura knew many, Lena knew many new songs, and Laura learned them quickly. Together, while the milk streamed under the bright tin pails, they sang, well, I'm not going to sing, but I'll read it to you. A life on the ocean wave, a home on the ro rolling deep. 
The polywogs wagged their tails, and te tears rolled down their cheeks. Sometimes Lena sang softly, and so did Laura. Oh, I wouldn't marry a farmer. He'd always, he's always in the dirt. I'd rather marry a railroad man who wears a striped shirt. But Laura liked the waltz songs the best. She loved the broom song, though they had to sing broom so many times to make the tune swing. By a broom, by a broom, broom, by a broom, broom, by a broom, broom. Will you buy all of this wandering Bavarian a broom to brush off the insects that come to annoy you? You'll find it quite useful by day and by night. The cows stood quiet, chewing their cuds. They chewing their cuds as though they were listening to the singing until the milking was done. Hey, that's what you got to do if you don't have a radio or a TV or any other device. You have to sing. Then, with the pails of warm, sweet-smelling milk, Laura and Lena walked back toward the shanties. Hey, shanties! That's one of your vocabulary words. And one of your spelling words. Shanties. Let's see if we can use our context clues to figure out what that word means. Then, with the pails of warm, sweet-smelling milk, Laura and Lena walked back toward the shanties. In the mornings, the men were coming out of the bunkhouse, washed in the, washing in the basins on the bench by the door, and combing their hair. So, what do we think shanties is, based on that sentence, using the words around it? Well, if you don't know, or if you do know, you, probably, you might know this by now. Shanties are like little houses put together quickly. A clue to that could be bunkhouse, or doors, bench by the door, or bunkhouse is really the clue there. Unless you don't know what a bunkhouse is. If you, if you move, if you take off the bunk, you're left with house. We know a house is where you live, so it's near shanties. A bunkhouse is kind of like an apartment. It's where they would go if they don't have a house and they're not staying in the shanties. It's where they go and they pay rent to live there. So it's kind of like an apartment. Okay. In the evenings, the sky flamed red and purple and gold. The sun had set and the teams and men were coming in, dark along the dusty road they worn on the prairie and singing. Then quickly, Lena hurried to Aunt Dosha's shanty and Laura to Ma's because they must strain the milk before the cream began to rise and help get supper. Lena had so much work to do, helping Aunt Dosha and Cousin Louisa, that she had no time to play. And Laura, though she did not work so hard, was busy enough, so they hardly ever met except at milking time. If I hadn't put our black ponies to work on the grade, Lena said one evening, you know what I'd do? No, what? Laura said. Well, if I could get away, and if we had the ponies to ride, we'd go see the men working, said Lena. Don't you want to? Yes, I want to, Laura said. She did not have to decide whether or not she would disobey Pa, because they couldn't do it anyway. Hey, side note. Earlier in the story, Pa had told them not to go into the railroad camp where the men were working. Because it wasn't safe for them to be uh, out wandering around. They're building a railroad. It's not a safe place to be. If we remember last week when in the story, they said something about they were trying to get people to go to their town, and there was hardly the only bad thing was there was lawsuits all the time. Yeah, it wasn't a very safe place to be all around by yourself. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly, one day at dinner, Pa sat down his teacup, wiped his mustache, and said, You asked too many questions, Flutter Budget. Put on your bonnet and come up to the store along, along about 2 o'clock. I'll take you out and let you see for yourself. Oh, Pa! Laura cried out. There, Laura, don't get so excited, Ma said quietly. Laura knew she should not shout. She kept her voice low. Pa, can Lena go too? We will decide about that later, said Ma. After Pa had gone back to the store, Ma talked seriously to Laura. She said that she wanted her girls to know how to behave, to speak nicely and low voices, and have gentle manners and always be ladies. They had always lived in wild, rough places, except for a little while on... Plum Creek, and now they are in rough railroad camp, and it would be some time before the country was civilized. Until then, Ma thought it best that they keep themselves to themselves. She wanted Laura to stay away from the camp and not get acquainted with any of the rough men there. It would be all right for her to go quietly with Pa to see, to see the work this once, but she must be well-behaved and ladylike. And remember that a lady never did anything that could attract attention. Hey, hold on, let's talk about that for a second. Again, remember last week in the story, in the ghost town story, they were advertising for people to come. They were advertising for, uh, what was it like, respectable women to come out here. Well, this is why. Respectable women like Ma here, nice ladies here. 
um, they needed some friends, so they advertised for them. Remember, we talked about that a little bit. And this is what, in 1860-something, this was what girls and women were supposed to be like. Quiet, well-behaved. Well, everybody should be well-behaved. But quiet, not attracting attention. And that's our dishwasher making weird noises. It's supposed to do that. Um, speak in a low voice and have gentle manners and not be loud. I don't know. What do you think? You want to live back then? Not be loud? No. Oh, Lily's shaking her head no. No. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the story. Yes, Ma, Laura said. And Laura, I do not want you to take Lena, said Ma. Lena is a good, capable girl, but she is boisterous, which means loud. And Dosha has not curbed her as much as she might. If you must go where those rough men are working in the dirt, then go quietly with your pa and come back oh, sorry. Yeah, and come back quietly and say no more about it. Yes, Ma, Laura said. But but what, Laura? Ma asked. Nothing, said Laura. I don't know why you want to go anyway, Mary wondered. It's much nicer in the shanty or taking a little walk by the lake. I just want to. I want to see them building a railroad, Laura said. She tried on her sunbonnet when she set out and resolved to keep it tied on. If you remember from um, the other Little House books, Laura has a really bad habit of not wearing her bonnet. And she always gets yelled at by Ma for not wearing her sunbonnet. So here she's making a conscious effort to keep her bonnet on. I mean, she's trying to be a lady. Okay, Pa was alone in the store. He put on his broad-brimmed hat and padlocked the door, and they went out on the prairie together. At the time of day, there were no shadows. The prairie looked level, but it was not. In a few minutes, its, swell, its swells hid the shanties, and on the grassy land, there was nothing to be seen but the dusty track of the road and the railroad grade beside it. Against the sky ahead rose up the smudge of dust, blowing away on the wind. Pa, pa held on to his hat, and Laura bent her head in the flapping sunbonnet, and they trudged along together for some time. Then Pa stopped and said, There you are, half pint. They were standing on a little rise of the land. Before them, the railroad grade ended bluntly. In front of it, men with teams and plows were plowing onward toward the west, breaking the wide strip of the prairie sod. Do they do it with plows? Laura asked. It seemed strange to her to think that men with plows went ahead into the country that had never been plowed to build a railroad. And scrapers, said Pa. Now watch, Laura. 